Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the basically the orientation meeting for the American Development Model or ADM track that we're doing for both the conference as well as something that Chris and DJ and I and a lot of other people through our ADM committee have been working on for the last year and a half plus now. So we're excited to uh, get this rolled out. And DJ, if you want to go ahead and pull up the slides, Chris can start telling us about how this all came to be. For sure. <clears throat> well, it's uh, the journey um, both for uh, me as an individual and for U.S. rowing as a as the national governing body. Uh, for me, it started in ninety nine two thousand, and I could I always wondered why we did you know we didn't do very well at World Championships as juniors. I just thought we're America, we have all these athletes, we should crush everything. And I took a trip to Italy and sat on the Ponte Vecchia and watched all these little Italian kids come out in skiffs. And I was like, well, that's, I think, you know, just like the epiphany was, they can move boats better than us. Like that, you know, if, if everybody over here is learning to row in a single, you know, that to me, that spoke to me right then and there. Um, from an NGB's uh, point of view, um, USOPC really pushed the concept of long-term athlete development, which we call ADM, right? American Development Movement. Um, to all of its sports. And I think hockey around 2009-10 was the first one to actually take the plunge. And they did some studies and found that uh, something like 74% of all kids quit organized sports by the time they're t between 12 and 14, quit. This, all the major sports were losing, losing people. So they, in an effort to find out why, did a lot of research and a lot of talks and studies. And they came up with more of a long-term approach to being an athlete in America. Um, and pace better. We're seeing specialization happen so earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, we're also seeing overuse injuries. We're seeing burnout. We're seeing people that are just, you know, disassociating themselves with sports and their sports that they love, maybe because they're starting at five and by the time they're 14, they're just, it's too much. So they wanted to find a way to stem this bleeding, to stem uh, the loss of athletes between 12 and 14 is, is the major one. Um, and they came up with what you see here on the screen, right? This is the USOPC American Developmental Model. Now, some sports like us, uh, we're um, you know lifelong sports and some sports aren't. And so what we did was we wanted to make the effort, well, every sport has sort of done it in their own, in their own vision. So if you look here, it's stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four and five for USOPC. If you look at the Canadian model, there's many more steps in there. If you look at our model, which um, in our path, what we did was COVID came along and you know we had a lot of Zoom time. So people like Will Ruth and DJ uh, have been invaluable because we created a committee that studied our own. How would we rowify is what we call it. How would we rowify the concept of long-term athlete development in our sport? Um, and in the, in the chat there, you'll see the link, um, you know, Will and DJ have done a, in just an incredible job. I told them earlier that move mountains to create our, to help create our uh, stages. And, and there are other people in there uh, that did. So if you look at this, this is um, what we came up with for our sport. And uh, as DJ will get into later, there's a lot of crossover periods of time because you can be a novice at 54 years old, right? Doesn't mean not all novices are 13, 14, and 15 years old and ninth graders in high school. Um, so uh, you know, what, would, what we felt was important was that at every level, fun and development were constantly encouraged, that what we did at each level was appropriate to the age, uh, the physiology, and the psychology of the athletes that were taking part in our sport in rowing. And so rather than getting into too much minutia, you know, this whole talk will be about our model and from just an overview point of view, and if you want to get really into the deep dive, you can go to our website. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's tricked out with resources, which will continue to grow. But for now, the overview is we created a, the rowified version on behalf of U.S. rowing um, of the long-term athlete development and what, you know, again, what we call the American developmental model. So this is the overview and I'll, I'll kick it back to you, Will. Awesome. Thanks for setting that up. Uh, yeah, DJ, if you could stay on the slide for a sec. The, the big Absolutely. key thing is that this is a this is a nonlinear model. So part of the problem with this was that the 
USOBC model had more of a, of a straight progression that was age-based through this. And uh, for rowing, we needed to have a couple parallel tracks and for it to be clear that people can move from one stage to another, sometimes even potentially bypassing one stage. So what we're going to do with this presentation today is basically just talk through this, hit the key points, make sure that everybody knows where to find everything on the website, uh, answer a couple of things that we think are going to be questions, and then have plenty of time at the end for Q&A to hear all of your questions about uh, long-term athlete development. So let's start off with stage one. Uh, Will, one more thing, one more point about that is we made three parallel, we are making three parallel versions of the ADM for juniors, for masters, and then we'll have the para-adaptive component as well. So this website will eventually have all three, and we are venturing much more into masters rowing this year uh, as a goal to have deliverables. So we will have a masters uh, ADM as well on the same website. So I just wanted to say that uh, separate those three. Um, basically in uh, stage one, um, you know, uh, DJ, did you want to go, Will, did you want DJ to go first on this? No, go ahead and start because give us the picture for people who do have youth appropriate equipment. That's another unique challenge of rowing is that it's not like yeah. cross or soccer or something where we can just throw kids out on a field and, and make it work. We've got to have special opportunities for children's bodies to be able to use the equipment. So go ahead and talk about that. And then we'll come to DJ for the general picture. Got it. Uh, you know, at this age, obviously, the fun aspect is probably the, the, you know, making the sport lovable and passionate about being outside and all that is one thing. Having the equipment that goes with the kids that's appropriate to them, if you can get your hands on it, it's extremely important. You know, whether it be the concept that sculling should be what they're doing, if they're going to do something and not bending out and twisting around their spine, um, but also little things like setting up the boat to fit their size. Uh, proper shoes, handles, you know, Croker makes those pink handles, the really small ones. You know, um, if, if and all possible, you want to find ways to make the equipment fit the kids. Proper loads, proper lengths, all of these things matter when you're, when you're dealing with the kids. Um, and you'll find like, you know, we took a stab, we found a research that was done in Australia on lengths and loads and, and um, you know, ratios for kids of this age, and you'll find that on the chart too. So we don't need to get into the specifics there. Uh, there's also links to the boat companies that do make boats appropriate to the size of, of this age group. So uh, it is important to find a way to fit the instruction and in, in what you're putting the kids in to match where they're at at this age. Most people are gonna start rowing after this age though, sometime in, in either late middle school, or early high school. So DJ, tell us about just a, a few key points for general athletic development for the U12 athlete. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so like Will just said, this stage um, can have uh, traditional Olympic style rowing in it, but a lot of us currently don't, ex don't discover rowing during this stage. So there's tons to do uh, if you don't have access to appropriate sized equipment, you can lean really heavily on the discover and play concepts. I mean, you want to have these kids uh, discovering just athletic movement in general and the sports that are available to them in their community. You want them outdoors. You want them getting used to being outdoors in, in various uh, weather conditions. And you want them passionate about the environment, the rivers that they're going to be using or lakes or ponds that they're going to be using to row. You want them aware and passionate about those. There's tons to learn. You want to make sure they, uh, you know, water safety on your riverways is known. And that can be learned in any boat. Uh, pictured is just a stage one athlete in a kayak. I mean, kayaks are a great way to tour a, a body of water for the first time you're facing forwards. It's a more traditional movement vehicle. So uh, it's a good way to do it. Um, and then you could teach them rowing basics uh, if you have the appropriate stage equipment, but there's tons to learn that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with uh, rowing equipment. And then play, uh, you want them having a ton of fun, high energy and low energy. Uh, I've seen a lot of success kind of switching the, the activity up fairly frequently. You don't want to stick with anything for too long, 40 minute hour blocks of a game followed by an indoor activity. Uh, is a really great way to kind of have them having fun, recharging, um, and learning movements that they're going to need to serve them for the rest of their athletic careers. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the big key is that everything that they learn athletically from this stage is going to come back to us later if they do become rowers. So make it fun, make it engaging, uh, get them into the environment and, and know that that's going to pay off because rowing is not a sport that highly rewards this early specialization idea. 
for me as a strength coach and in my strength training talk later, we're basically going to do a similar presentation to this, but all focused on strength training through the stages. And what I'm focusing on is development of the AMSCs or athletic motor skill competencies. So you'll read a lot about that on the website in the strength training content. This is uh, eight different general athletic skills like lower body unilateral, lower body bilateral, upper body pushing, and very general athletic skills that basically every child under age 12 should develop to become an athlete. So that's a lot of what we're focused on there. It also falls right in line with this discover, learn, play concept. So check in later to hear more about that. You know, one thing, can I just say one thing about that, Will, is that if we don't take the time to, to worry about fundamental movement, if we don't take the time to do these things, one of the parts of specialization that we're seeing in America is because kids don't play a lot of sports anymore, they specialize too soon. In this age group here, we're not making better athletes most of the time. We're actually making the inverse, right? We're not taking the time to learn all the different types of movements, and that carries over. So we'll we will you know, bear the brunt of that if we don't take the time and make efforts to do this as well. Um, so for a couple of points through this, we're gonna just kind of point out specific uh, design choices that were made when we were building this. Um, and one of them is the overlapping uh, stages for chronological age. Stage one goes from zero to 13, stage two from 10 to 19 stage three from 13 to 19 and stage four begins at 17. So there's a lot of overlap there and we thought it was important to point out why. Primarily this is just due to the variance in development you can see in youth athletes. Um, this graph here is just a uh, height velocity chart for biological male and females uh, projected over um, the stages here. And what you can see is that females as a whole tend to experience uh, their growth spurt and their sort of uh, physical development a lot earlier, about two years earlier than guys. It's got to be said, these graphs are very uh, simple dimension, one dimensional for what is actually a pretty varied uh, event. Both of these curves are about 50th percentile, both in timing and uh, height velocity. So females can really experience their growth spread as early as 10 and a half and be delayed until 12 and a half. Males, same thing. Uh, 12 and a half to 14. Half. So there's a huge variance in when this can occur. And we really wanted to build stages that reflected that there's uh, a female athlete at 10 and a half might be ready for stage two. Whereas a uh, biological male athlete at 13 or 14 even might not be ready for stage three, but they are going to need a space where they can grow. Because as, as it's been shown again and again in research, the early success or early development doesn't actually correlate to the long-term success down the line. So a rock star rower at 14 isn't, as, isn't any more or less likely to find success as an adult than somebody who took a little later to develop. So just because they're not developing quickly, they still need that space to develop and grow. So everybody's going to get to hear a lot more about stage two and the middle school program in Manny's talk up next. Um, and DJ, we've got a big window on that screen right now. If you can oh, sorry. out of that. Yeah. Um, but Chris, go ahead and give us just a few, a few key points here for coaching that, uh, stage two middle school and, or recreational or community junior programs. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself too. Just, just making sure you were listening. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think the, the trap with the middle school programming is that everybody there's two, there's two major reasons why people think they want to get into middle school rowing and, and delve into it. Uh, one is obviously financial, keep the boathouse healthy economically and so on. The other is they think they're getting a leg up on the competition by getting the kids in earlier and getting them rowing based earlier, that they're going to be faster later, right? They're going to beat their, their competitors. And there's something to be said for that. At the same time, it's apples to oranges. What the kids need and what we're, we're looking to use them for uh, competitively happens too soon. To spend too much time and, and attention on winning or to spend too much time on not making this a journey and making this a destination is, is detrimental to the young athletes. And so at this age, you know, after years of doing this at Saratoga, and we have quite a large, you know, 65, 75 kids uh, in middle school, keeping this fun is the single greatest thing, keeping them active, keeping them healthy and happy uh, and with a, a variety of, of on and off the water activities is what I think you'll get the most fulfilling experience for the kids. 
Um, so taking away the competition, not that you don't compete or not that you don't uh, uh, do things that, that are competitive, but not making that the reason that you're there. Uh, and I think, so that's what I would say about that. All in, directly in line with that for me is that strength training for this stage is as much about teaching a lifelong passion for physical fitness as it is about developing any rowing specific qualities. So we're not even really thinking sport specificity here. There's still lots of benefits to strength training for the athletes who do care about that. But the big thing is that if we can, if we can teach good fundamental movements and then appreciation for healthy strength training in middle school and in high school, even not connected to rowing, then that's really going to pay off for athletes down the road. And a big thing that we're thinking about here is that rowing is a row for life model. Uh, rowing or at least physical fitness is something that athletes should be able and want to do for their whole life. And if we, if we get it right at this stage, then that becomes a lot easier later on. And so leading into stage three, before we leave stage two, it begins fairly early on chron in chronological age, uh, as early as age 10, and it extends all the way through their youth career if they want. Uh, and it's really kind of serving two distinct populations, um, a, middle, a middle school athlete who might want to try being a competitive youth athlete later on in their lives, whether they're sure they want to, or they just want to try it out, stage two is going to be for them. Or if they decide that they really just want to continue to enjoy the sport, enjoy being active, enjoy the community at a boathouse uh, without kind of increasing their commitment or the intensity of their training, stage two is going to be for them until they graduate. It could be a way for them to stay engaged and active. Um, so really the shift into stage three comes when a stage two athlete uh, is able to vocalize or be aware that they want to be more competitive. Um, they want to compete as a primary function of why they row. Um, and so their shift into stage three is going to reflect that uh, training is going to remain fun. Fun always needs to be prevalent, either you know, small daily quantities, or it can be a, you know, a week of fun after a long seat, a long training season. It just needs to remain constant there. Um, but training is going to become more structured, uh, more targeted, um, still be multi-sport, but there might be a little more thought to what sports you play, maybe ones that complement rowing or other primary sports. Um, and again, they're going to compete primarily for the sake of finding best competition available to them and the best way for them to develop their skills. Uh, stage two athletes are going to compete as well, but they're going to be looking for something slightly different. Uh, primarily, you know, what is a really positive experience for them? What's a place for them to test their skills just as an individual rather as, you know, against competition. Um, so that kind of brings us to the second model design. Stage two and three run parallel to each other through their teenage and preteen years. Um, and most boathouses might find that they're going to run these either parallelly or actually in the same group. And finding out how to do that successfully is a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that most high school coaches already find themselves dealing with. So this, this model doesn't necessarily introduce it. It just kind of characterizes and highlights it. And so Right here, just a simple Venn diagram with stage two on the left, stage three on the right. And what we found is the content of these stages are actually fairly similar, but it's the lens or sort of the minutia within them that kind of shifts. So both stages, you're going to have athletes playing multiple sports. Why they do that is going to be a little different. Stage three is going to be to complement their rowing and, and stay active. Stage two is because they want to just experience different things. They want to continue to develop basic motor skills without specifically targeting their rowing ability. Both are going to attend races um, if they want to. It's going to be stage two. It's going to be much more optional. You're going to want to find spaces for them to develop their personal skills um, and have good experiences. Stage three, they're looking for the best competition. They want to test themselves. They want to continue to improve on the regional or national level. This comes in, I think it's just race selection. The local, the local scrimmage where you're able to put out small boats or a creative schedule to allow you get certain things is a great place for a stage two athlete. Stage two athletes don't necessarily need to be put up against the top region's second varsity eight. That's not going to be an enjoyable experience for them. That's not going to be why they do it. That is why stage three athletes are going to, you know, once they're committed to competition, they're going to be looking for really good opportunities to test themselves and the best competition they could find. Um, again, both are going to participate in a fun structure and ongoing training environment uh, to structure and target and improve the skills. Again, it's the content um, of what the training is and why they're doing it that's gonna differ. Um, and both are gonna be filled with challenges. Stage two is not 
devoid of challenge. There's going to be plenty of challenges every day. It's just what kind of challenges there. It could be a new boat class. It could be a new drill. It could be a heart more challenging variation of a drill. Um, it, the challenges are what is going to keep the sport rewarding and seeing the growth that a stage two athlete's looking for. Stage three athletes, same thing, but the lens with which those challenges are viewed, it's going to be to further develop and get them closer to their training and competition goals. So the content's going to be the same. It's just tonally and making sure you can tie it back to what that individual athlete is looking for is going to be super important. The big thing for this and where we depart from the USOPC model the most is making space for a community or recreational high school junior program. So the acknowledgement that in rowing, participation in rowing just for the sake of participation in rowing is a positive thing, even if the athlete doesn't move on to the next level into stage four competitive uh, collegiate rowing. Um, but we wanted to make sure that our model reflected this same chronological ages, potentially same developmental ages, but different athlete motivations, different end goals that we're looking to get out of the training. Uh, one of those challenges is around how to encourage multi-sport play and development and how rowers should know if and when it is time to move from stage two to stage three or how it is uh, when, when it's time to specialize. Chris, go and tell us some about that with your experience. Uh, there, there's a couple uh, aspects of this. Uh, number one, when we started branching out into this age group and, and having the crossovers, we collectively, and when I say collectively, our entire, in New York State, the Albany region is where I live. Um, we, as a group, had some people with incredible vision. And so all of us in the area uh, did a couple things together collectively. So all 16 teams at that time came together and made sure that, number one, we were going to slow down the role of these kids in this age group. And some of the things that we did was make sure that every kid at all of our programs was going to skull. So in this age group, they all sculled. And so when we did things together or when there was a little competition mixed in or we would have the old school dual meets, like you don't see the, the scrimmages anymore, we would make it fun. And, but we would also do it apples to apples. So we went with Cox quads and we went with octuples so that we were only buying riggers for already existing hulls. We didn't make this an economic burden to, to deal with these kids. For these kids, um, we have to remember that they have to play multiple sports. And the, the, the challenge there is that as a boathouse, as you grow as a boathouse and as the economics grow, you need them to be there year round. So therefore we have a responsibility to make sure that we are diversifying the types of training and the types of things that we're doing with these kids so that they're not just rowing year round at 12, 13 and specializing too soon because as you've seen on the different charts, they're in different places physiologically, they're in different places with their develop, physical development and even emotionally and mentally. So, um, you know, you've got to meet them where they're at. So if you're just having these kids come for competition and that's what you're promising, you're going to have a problem at some point where there's going to be whys in the road where kids have to choose what they want to do. And so you've got to meet them where they're at in terms of uh, competition wise. So just making them all go to competition. You might have a lot of kids that that's not their thing. They just want to row and they love rowing. And you've got to find a way to keep that going. Oh, oh, I mentioned earlier when I went to Italy, one of the things that I watched every day is the kids would come out and play soccer for 45 minutes to an hour, and then they would row or vice versa. They'd get off and they do games. Uh, my friends in Germany say that when they would do competitions for this age group, uh, rather than just make it rowing, they would have like many field days where you'd get a ribbon for running. You'd do swimming. If you went indoors, you played basketball or volleyball or handball in Europe is big. So you have to find ways to meet the kids and make it healthy and fulfilling for them. Uh, to do this and not just to specialize and make it all about the winning. Um, and, you know, like we had a rule, uh, the ninth graders in, in Saratoga, I would make them do cross country skiing or pick a sport, but they couldn't come back to the boathouse until February. So from November to February, I wanted them to experience another sport they weren't allowed back. Um, so, you know, those are, those are some of the thoughts on, spe on, on specializing or when, when and what we did for competition with the age group in the crossovers. I think that strength training plays a big part in that too, that if you, if you do three seasons of rowing, we should definitely have an off season in there. That fourth season is, is tailor made for something that maybe isn't necessarily a whole different sport, but is at least athletically diverse. So that that's an opportunity to train different physical skills to get outside of the rowing pattern. But then for me, for stage three, my big goal is that all junior rowers go to the next level whether that's collegiate or, or U19 or graduating high school and going into the row for life stage, which we'll hear about in a minute, 
with a strength training introduction. So even if it doesn't contribute to immediate performance, which it does, but, but even if it doesn't, it accelerates development at the next level because the collegiate coach or whoever's co coaching the mess can start with somebody who is athletically primed to add load, add volume, intensify their training and go to the next level. So that's falls in line with the train and compete idea that we are teaching high school athletes how to train, how to be competitive, even if we're not focused on their immediate yeah. competitiveness. Let's go and go into stage four. And this is going to be our, our quickest one because it's, it's really not the focus of this conference, but it is something that we're going to hear more about later. So Chris, tell us a little bit about the uh, current kind of high performance scene that we're looking at. Well, what we're trying to do is create various levels of opportunity and, and challenge the the teenager appropriately where they're at at the moment. So, you know, you heard Dr. Seiler say it earlier, um, you might have a, a general training program for everybody in the boat, but they're all different individually in the boat. And it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't correlate that they should all be doing the same volume. They, should all, they shouldn't all be doing the intensity. So we're trying to make appropriate levels where these kids can join us at that level. Uh, they're, you know, in right level. So HB, for instance, if you have kids that are on a separate path because they're that much uh, more developed or ready to go, um, you know, at Saratoga, we would make separate workouts or side workouts for them. We would, we would point them towards a different target, a different goal, because they were, they were able to be that and, and do that. We wouldn't just do that for all of the kids. Um, what we're trying to do, I mean, to reinforce is that this rowing is for life, right? It's not for one goal at 18. And if you don't make it, you fail, then you should quit rowing. Like we're constantly trying to move towards something. So, um, you know, making sure that we are being appropriate at the, you know, whether the kid is a high performance athlete or not, give them appropriate goals, give them appropriate training for that, to, for them to excel. Great. One of the things too with this is that this chronological age starts at 17 or, or end of, end of junior year, start of senior year idea. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the point at which we can start to move for that competitive talented uh athlete who's who's ready and interested in the next level collegiate recruitment etc uh that that's where we can start increasing and focusing on performance more than the uh more more participation ideas of the training and compete stage three um from strength training just to briefly address the high performance or collegiate picture it's it's the most nuanced at this stage but always comes back to the ideas of periodization and individualization. Periodization being the idea that, that the athletes by this point are too talented to be able to do everything at peak level year round. So we need to have some system of prioritizing which qualities we're focusing on when, uh, whereas that's maybe not quite as true, certainly not for stage two, where we're thinking about general lifelong fitness and for stage three, where the athletes are still developing that competitiveness. Uh, we, we might not need to take as much of a periodized approach. Definitely by stage four, though. And then individualization just based on what the athlete has, has trained and experienced in the past. With the ADM, we're always thinking chronological age, developmental age, and training age. So by 17 plus, developmental age, biological age become a little bit more blurred. Training age becomes much more important. So how much experience has each athlete had with each modality of training? So you hear more about that in the strength training talk. Let's go on to stage five then. And we're, we're, we're going through this intentionally quickly because A, all the information is there on the website in detail. B, you're going to hear more about the talks or more about the details and specific talks later. And then we also want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So uh, Chris, tell us about stage five, Row for Life. Well, and it is exactly what it says. Like uh, one of the things that we sell families and athletes on is that you can do this for life, that it's a non-contact sport, that it's, you know, we have all these little pitches that we make to parents of 14 and 15 year olds. Uh, but do we live up to what we say? Do we say, do we live up to what we say we are? And the goal should be, you know, are we creating rowing for life models or are we creating, trying to win as much as possible by 18 or 19? And the answer is, some of the ways that you can you can look at this and are we doing it right is that how many masters rowers are there in the country and i'm sure that there's a lot of variables and, and reasons why but if that's not growing but juniors are constantly growing 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 the master's pool of athletes is not growing the people who row post-college 
if that's not growing, then obviously we are not, we're doing something wrong to keep those athletes in the sport. Because if you can row a single, you, you don't, you know, Will and I were talking earlier, you know, somebody who told me that oh, I learned how to row in high school and I just can't find a place to, with, you know, other guys to row an eight, you know? And so I realized that person was saying that they felt trapped, that they couldn't find a place that seven other people in a coxswain would show up every day or whenever they wanted to row randomly and fit into their life and continue to row. So what aren't we doing to keep people in the sport to row for life? You know, where we, where can we be better to keep the pathway going for people to enjoy the sport that we say is for life? Um, how do we keep the involvement going there? Because at some point there should be a tipping point where the master's group totally overwhelms the size of the juniors because we're retaining these athletes. We're retaining people with the passion, we're retaining, we're retaining people with the healthy aspects of it, and we're retaining people who just for the joy of rowing uh, do it. So, you know, uh, U.S. Rowing is going to try to come up with like this weekend is for juniors. We're going to try to come up with a weekend like this for masters. We're going to try to find ways to encourage people to stay in and make opportunities for them to stay in the sport. Uh, and uh, this pathway and the ADM for masters, I think, is going to help as well. Uh, that's we're just going to identify uh, strategies and and keep working towards that. And then additionally, one of the cool things about the USOPC model and that rowing has a lot of opportunities for too, is if you don't want to continue physically rowing yourself as a master's rower, lots of ways to continue to engage with, with rowing. So whether that's through uh, coaching or club management or officiating, we would love to see people want to continue to be part of the rowing community. And then for me as a strength coach, one, one of the things that, that, I, it hurts me the most, I guess, is when I hear from former teammates of mine who are who did collegiate rowing and whatever and are, are totally inactive now. They burn themselves out from so much training, so much training, so much training, or they didn't ever learn how to actually train themselves. They just showed up to the practice, did the training, and then and then didn't really absorb anything beyond the uh, physiological adaptation. So we want consistent exercise to be a part of everybody's life former athlete and not. Uh, and we have the ERG as one of the most effective pure exercise tools uh, that, that exists. And yet so many people, myself included, burn out on it as competitive rowers that then it, it can take years or never to ever want to come back to it. So part of what we're trying to do here yeah. is, is make, make this something that people can do and want to do long-term wherever they are, whether it's close to a rowing program or not. So that's kind of the fit for life idea. And it's a, there's a philosophy to it, as you're, you're mentioning, the pressure for a 2K or the pressure to win is making this a destination versus a journey um, philosophy. You know, like uh, Justin Moore once gave me an example, like in Europe, they can watch a soccer game, finish 0-0 and think it was the best game they ever watched play. Most Americans are furious that somebody didn't win and somebody didn't lose. And there's just a difference of philosophy there of, you know, why does there have to be winning or losing? Why does everything have to be based on, on that result? Um, you know, the I think people hate the ERG because of the 2K. But the ERG is a phenomenal machine to keep you fit, as, as you were just saying, Will. And I think that's what you're seeing, like companies like Hydro making it an experience, you know, different bodies of water, what, you know, being able to see what you're doing. And then it's more meaningful. The activity is more meaningful. And then lastly, of course, is the, the fitness you talk about. America's not a very fit place, you know, generally speaking, you know, this should be a reason to keep doing it. Uh, the ERG shouldn't be a reason to stop because you hate the ERG and you blame the ERG. Uh, so I just wanted to, to, you know, in the, in the chat, by the way, we're seeing people mentioned, um, mention, you know, like in the Netherlands, uh, field hockey is not only a sport, but it's a social network. It's a social club. Uh, I think you'll see a lot of rowing boathouses if I think about West Side, if I think about uh, the Detroit area, if I think about Philly and Boathouse Row, it's part of their culture. If, you, if you've ever been to, to uh, St. Catharines, Canada, you know, you're, you're talking about every age group into the 80s constantly showing up on the island and taking part in the sport in some way, shape or form. And that's just amazing. You know, if we thought more like those places, uh, you know, when I, when I was starting out in coaching, West Side would have 50 something volunteer coaches because they couldn't let go of the sport and i always thought that wouldn't it be great if we were like you know more people that were like that so sorry will to jump in no it's okay 
let's go let's go to the next one and and talk about where we go from here because where we go from here for this weekend is an all ADM conference track so if you want to participate in the green highlighted uh, conferences for the remainder of this conference then you will hear uh, about building a middle school program my strength training talk coaching junior scholars uh, a, we have a physical therapist to, to talk about prehab for developing athletes and keeping rowers healthy uh, Caitlin McLean is going to talk about this transitionatory period from like the stage two early novice to the competitive high school rower to then how and when do we identify and move that athlete into the next level so from stage two to three to four uh, and then Eric Gerke is going to talk about creating a training program and some of these long-term development fundamentals. And then Chris, tell us where ADM goes beyond this weekend, because this is our soft rollout and we have more ideas beyond this. So ADM, you know, one of the things that we, we spent, you know, basically the last year, two years doing with this committee is creating a, um, a page, a place that you can go and learn more. And there was a question in here about how do I deal with a coach who demands a three season rowing commitment when a student athlete is hearing from colleges, they want uh, multi-sports. So what we're hoping to do is educate, uh, first of all, with this website, a place where parents, coaches, um, athletes can go and learn more about what is a more proper approach to training and specialization. Um, so th the base question is, uh, you know, what, where does it go from here? Well, first, the ADM website, we're hoping to continue to fill out, to continue to evolve, to continue to give the basics and, the, and um, the basic principles, but also to expound upon those and provide resources that help everybody learn more and become better at what we're, we're, we're doing here. Um, the Where do we go from here for ADM? We plan on having a webinar. You know, we'd love your feedback on the initial website. Uh, we plan to evolve and get better. Uh, then we plan to have a webinar um, up and to introduce it officially to everybody in the sport that they can attend the webinar. We can actually do a little bit more deep dive into certain aspects of um, you know, the stages. Um, and then what hopefully where this goes is we create certification programs where you can be certified in each of the stages uh, that are important to your club. So if you want to learn more about stage two and stage three, you can go and get a, a much deeper dive into what is appropriate and what is healthier and what's safer. Um, if you are more, if you're a master's coach, we intend to have uh, the ability to have you, you know, a chances, opportunities to become more educated in all the aspects that, you know, coach, you know, it's funny, you coach, there's a, there's the age group from 13 to 19, but Coaching somebody who's 22 and is a master's rower is a lot different than coaching somebody who's 63 and a master's rower, but they're all master's rowers, right? But they're not. So there's a lot of, a lot of changes and variations, whether it be strength and conditioning or lifting or, or psychologically or physiologically um, uh, between genders. There's so many ways that we can improve. And we, our hope is looking forward that we continue to strive to give people the opportunity to become more proficient, whatever, wherever they, they uh, fit in this five-stage rowified version of, of long-term athlete development for the American development model. So hope I didn't overspeak that, Will. No, that's good. Uh, folks can start sending in their, their questions because we're going to Q&A next. Uh, Chris, one of the things that we talked about was that uh, we started off a year and a half ago with a volunteer task force of, I think it was about 10 10 coaches all told to just basically brainstorm. It was super helpful to just kick ideas around. How are we going to align the stages? How are we going to make all the, the whole pathway work at the big picture level before we really focused into the specific principles, training methods, resources, et cetera. If you would like to be involved in the next uh, volunteer iteration of this, do please contact Chris. Anything else you want to say about that, Chris? Yeah, you know, um, when we first started this, we all had a little bit more free time because of COVID that first year, um, you know, and it was, uh, you know, the guys, DJ and, and Will will tell you, it was long and drawn out. And there were points where I think we all were like, we're not going to make this. We're not going to do this. And here we are now. From here, this is a launching point that we can actually diversify and have opportunities. If you want to volunteer and you have a particular interest in master's rowing, we can start making subcommittees that can really delve into certain aspects of our five stages. Um, and take some of the load off of those original 10 people who we were meeting once a week for at least an hour for almost a full year. If you, I'm sure you guys remember, uh, remember that, uh, Will and DJ. 
Um, if you'd like to be involved, more involved, um, from here, we're looking to launch and, and, and get better at each of the stages. And, and I think there's plenty of opportunities that, that if you want to be involved, you can be. Just reach out to me and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, what about, so questions that we have here. Is it okay, Will, if we get start getting into some of these questions? Yep. There's a it. couple in there. Um, so uh, Aaron asks, how would you approach a high school coach who requires a three season rowing commitment when a student athlete is hearing from college crew coaches that they want to be multi-sports? Well, a couple of things. Number one, this website is a resource for everybody. Those coaches, you can point those coaches in this direction or, or the club or high school that they work for can approach this, um, this topic in, um, uh, in, in, by coming to the website and learning more. There's an, an immense amount of, of information online that you can tap into as to why uh, specializing in one sport year round is not healthy. Um, again, I don't know what, what the age, uh, Aaron, I don't know what the age of the athlete is. I don't know what the, uh, the level of the team that they're, ra they're racing for is. But if it's a high school team, you must have also oversight from an athletic director if, if any of the boundaries are being crossed uh, with too much or too, too intense or too, too, you know, the volume and so on. Uh, but I, was, I would say that educating somebody, educating each of us is the, probably the answer, right? It, you know, and also, what is that coach being told by the athletic director or the, the hierarchy in the school? Is winning the preeminent reason why they have a team? Um, I know in my school, my AD would love kids to play multiple sports and not specialize. You know, when I was a kid, we, you know, I played four sports and that's what our, everybody did. Everybody in my area played four sports. Nowadays, you know, my son plays one sport now and he's, he's 14 and I'm trying to, to force him to go to other, what, he's doing other things, but it's a battle because he's getting messaging from the coach that you should only be doing this. And so I personally, you know, think of this, I'm involved in ADM and at home, my kids tell me he has to do soccer all year. So you can imagine that I'm trying to go to this coach and say, as a dad, and just say, hey, this isn't, this isn't you know, what's the best interest of these kids at this age. But as, as the US rowing ADM guy, I'm, I'm also trying to not lean on the guy and say, look, this isn't healthy. I, <laughs> but I'm trying to be a dad, right? So uh, Aaron, I would say that um, there are multiple avenues. And I think the education is just going to have to seep into uh, the, the paradigm has to change as a whole, and, um, and, and a new approach has to be taken. Um, I, and, I don't know if that fully answers, but I'm well, hoping that. Chris, you're also a fan, a fan of strength training, and if we can work in some of those fundamentals into the training environment. <laughs> Uh, sure. I've had physical therapists come and work with a rowing program to how can we design a better prehab circuit like you're going to hear about from Lisa later. Uh, that's, that's a way to break up that three seasons. So it's not just three seasons of rowing, erging, load, volume, right. rowing, erging, load, volume, but that we're getting some of that athletic diversity training in that we're building up the body to be able to deal with that load. So, I mean, I think that that's something we're trying to do with this document overall is not the prescriptive or overbearing or overly idealistic, but to say, here's these general ideas, here's these resources. Now let's figure out how each program, each coach, each rower can put it into practice in their own environment. And Will, you know, the strength training aspect is, is tremendous because it's injury prevention if you're doing it right. It's, it's, it, there are aspects of, of uh, what Lisa's going to talk about for prehab, how you can make the body so much better and ready for, for those loads. Um, I, interesting story. There was a, a period of time when Marin men were destroying everybody on the water. And I remember calling Graham and saying, Graham, what the heck is going on? Like, how all of a sudden did you just leave the pack? so easily like i mean they were dominating everything it didn't matter what the race was the distance was it didn't matter if it was open weight or lightweight and he's and he laughed and he said you know chris i've been trying to figure this out too he goes the only thing i introduced that was different than to any other program i've ever done was yoga he's like i don't have injuries like we, i'm not seeing you know the, the kind of fatigue mentally or emotionally um they're just healthier mind body and body and when they come to practice and yoga is a big part of that. And, and I remember thinking yoga, like, are you, are you serious, Graham? I, I said, you're lying. You know, like he's no, I'm not. Yoga is the only thing that I've decided to make time for that's different. And I can tell you right now, what, whose program started doing yoga the very next season, <laughs> this guy. And, um, and so when you talk about strength training, when you talk about strength and conditioning, when you talk about yoga, there are so many other healthy things that you can add 
that you think won't inc bring speed out of your boats, but will, you know, but you just, you, I mean, you have to get, we, we have to get out of the mindset is that we have to be out there and we have to do so many K a week. And it has to be, if we're not in the boat, we're getting slower. Because that's not the truth. We're finding more and more with all the studies that that is simply not the truth. Well, um, Dr. Seiler talked about the benefit of having that recovery day, coming back more rested, yeah. being able to get out of the rest of the, being able to get more out of the rest of the training. We have somebody at the Q&A who comments that encouraging athletes to play other sports has found that it creates stronger, fitter, more enthusiastic, more enthusiastic mm -hmm. athletes and has boosted enrollment. So not, not losing people, but you're actually gaining people because they're more engaged in rowing at the start of each season. I used to, I wrestled in my off season. Then uh, another thing I know you're a big fan of, uh, and I was so excited to get out of the mat room back into open air on the water in the spring that that made me so much more ready plus fitter to come back to rowing in the spring. I want to go back to something that Aaron said about, you know, what do you say to that high school coach that, that uh, does three, you know, demands three seasons. One of the things I, I would say is, and Larry Laszlo makes a good uh, point in the, in the chat that there's a difference between club and high school rowing. So when, if you say in scholastic rowing, I'll say, if you're saying high school, I don't know if that's a club rower or somebody who attends a high school and is overseen scholastically. If it's scholastically, you have an AD and you have hierarchy. And if there are injuries or, discontent you can go to you can go to that overhead if you're paying money to go to a club then you have club management that you have to you're gonna have to appeal to uh so that i just want to amend that answer a little bit that there are different there are different avenues depending on what style of team your child your your athlete is on and then how you approach the situation you know in the high school the coaches are at the mercy of the administration in the club right the parents are at the mercy of whoever, whomever is the director and what their philosophy is and, and how much winning comes into play. So, and this is um, again, why, why our idea is not to present a prescriptive, you must go do these things in right. your program <clears throat> and to say, here's what the USOPC says with their task force of researchers and medical professionals and longtime coaches. And here's how we're adapting that to work in the rowing environment. Um, qu question came in that our struggle is a lack of coaches to meet the variety of levels masters, juniors, competitive, novice, lifelong. Uh, what are your suggestions on how to meet this need and having to have uh, coaches and safety launches on the water with any rower? DJ, I know this is something that you've worked with in your high school role of how, how do we manage uh, and, and co coaching with a master's program too. So do you have any ideas on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like the issue Deb is facing specifically is, if I understand it, is developing the, the number of coaches necessary. I think um, so what, I mean, it, it's finding ways to in it, increase your community and through, uh, so just, I think getting people to start through, uh, you know, erg, erg outreach, getting people to start it, uh, finding easier ways for people to enter the sport is going to increase the number of people likely to maybe pick up coaching who didn't follow a traditional rowing career, which might help if you're, if you're in a place that maybe doesn't have like a strong bedrock of rowing, maybe they move there, um. And then just getting coaches to realize that, uh, you know, it's really just a shift in tone. Most every individual wants to be challenged, wants to be able to have moments of mastery after developing themselves, the social aspect. Um, there's not a huge difference uh, when, when the goals and the, when the training is framed appropriately to the shift to masters athletes, it's uh, really just about understanding what they're looking for and what you're able to provide them. But I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think it sounds like the board's right or the town is right. Having, you know, that supervision is going to be key for a lot of the, at least the introductory training. DJ, one of the things that we there's talked there's, about uh, was, was just that having the, I remember you mentioned that having the vocabulary about stage two, stage three, here's these things was helping mm -hmm. even just on your coaching staff with, with having those discussions. Yeah. Um, ab yeah. I mean, the, the realization and, and this process has been super rewarding for me. I mean, the realization that challenge exists it, just simple like challenge exists without competition I mean, you don't need to race to find a way for somebody to feel really accomplished about the work that they're doing and even specifically the rowing training that they're doing there's so many ways to measure it so many ways to frame uh what the individual's doing how they're moving that i mean really like the the vocabulary and the, and the lens is going to be key there 
so one of the things that we're trying to do is provide those resources to be able to meet that need. So we, we know that there's all these different types of rowers. We know that coaches need this knowledge, but, but where do you go for this knowledge right now? It's sort of scattered around places. Chris has sat in that seat to do hundreds of webinars, but it's kind of hard to find the relevant information right now. So we're trying to present kind of a, a one-stop orientation material for people to go and, and get access to a lot of stuff. Chris, what do you think? Uh, well, and I think there's also a, a, a portion of this that has to be more intentional. So when you ask about, hey, there's not enough coaches, there was a point this fall where there were 206 coaching uh, positions open, right? COVID really did a number on the number of people who could afford to give up their time to be coaches. And I think the law of supply and demand is going to kick in. Like, if you're not intentional about making coaching a profession at your club, or if you're not intentional about compensation or allowing somebody to be there, then you're, we're going to have a shortage of coaches. If we don't uh, appreciate, and I don't mean it like we don't appreciate the coaches, but I mean, if we want coaches to be able to be coaches, then it has to be at a professional level, right? We have to start looking at this more. Um, and I, some of the countries that are being, you know, put in the chat here or other places, you know, coaching rowing is a profession. And so counting on volunteers is always going to be hard, especially as DJ is saying, the, the, volunteer, the volunteer coach that has the right tools to handle the masters or to handle the younger ages or whatever. I mean, so I would say we're trying to present the opportunity to give the skills for each of those levels. And that's what we're going to continue to endeavor moving forward, um, you know, by, by providing all this information in one place, by providing the resources, by, by providing coaching education. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, yeah, uh, it's mentioned in the chat that we're also losing teachers at, at, at the same, you know, same scale. Um, but it has to be intentional, right? If this is something we want to do, we took particular, in my home club, we took particular interest in kids who had the aptitude or the intention of wanting to learn more about coaching. And over time, there was a point where Eric and I had 45 kids who were coaching other places at one point in time. And that was one of our greatest successes, that they, we, that they loved the sport so much they wanted to go on and be a coach. So we cultivated that. This conference that you're sitting in right now was established so that I could have it in Saratoga and all my kids, all my seniors and juniors could go to it as students. And some of them became coaches. So that, you know, it's, it's the irony of sitting here right now is, is not lost on me. Um, could it's, there encouraging, be a, it's encouraging that lifelong participation, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, could there be a parallel path of the ADM to develop coaches? The answer, Candace, is absolutely. And uh, part of what I was trying to articulate, probably too wordy, was that our intention is to create more classes more coursework that to certify people and so that they can go on and and sell those services or be uh be that level of a coach uh to develop uh to develop uh coaches that are articulate in each of these stages or as adm as a whole so that was part of will's thing where do we go from here those are some of the places that we endeavor to, to move towards Chris, here's one for you uh because you and i talked a lot about stage one early <clears throat> beginnings this yeah. week uh, do you think U.S. as a nation introduces athletes to rowing early enough compared to other countries we might be a little bit delayed? And is this a reflection of, of broader success? What are the factors there? So what, what do you think is stopping us from being able to introduce rowing earlier? Do you think that would be valuable? It's at least a two-pronged question. Uh, do we uh, introduce kids earlier, early enough? Um, probably not. But let me just say this. When I say probably not, we introduce kids to soccer very early and we're not nearly a world power in soccer we we introduce kids early in most sports and they burn out as you've seen the numbers for the usopc 74 percent of them quit between 12 and 14 so i don't know michael if introducing the kids earlier is the answer here's the other thing we think bigger is better we think more is better in america so i had an epiphany when i was in tokyo and i was standing on the dock and i was watching the germans and the italians walk down uh, Italian uh, young ladies and the German young ladies are walking down with their quads. And I noticed the American athletes were always bigger, massive. And the erg, when, in every boat class, we probably had the best erg score average, right? And we got pounded on the water, pounded. It wasn't that we didn't start early enough. It wasn't that we didn't, you know, erg enough. We obviously did. We had the best erg scores. The problem that it was is we didn't move boats. These kids who were walking towards me from these other countries, I knew if I said, hey, the water's too rough, guys, practice is going to be a 5K, drop the boat and go for a run, that the Europeans could do it no problem. The Americans, they were more like thoroughbreds. We were more like Clydesdales. 
right? So, Michael, part of the problem is the manner in which we're, we're approaching athleticism, the manner in which we're specializing in getting overuse injuries, the manner in which we're, we're trying to teach people to row is not like, hey, let's make them athletes first and who happen to row. It's like, let's make rowers stronger. And we're not going to win like that. We're not going to, so the, uh, the irony for me is that we're trying to win medals and we're doing it ass backwards to everybody else in the world. Like we're getting crushed by countries that have athletes rowing because through their younger years and teenage years, they were encouraged to do other sports. They were encouraged to treat it uh, physically differently, athletically, but they were also encouraged emotionally and psychologically different. They didn't go in where every race was the end all be all. You had to win this, week, this weekend. They didn't, you know, it's like the zero zero soccer game, right? They love rowing. It was a lifelong endeavor for them. So I just think that we, our paradigm is fundamentally flawed. And I don't think teaching kids to row younger is better. I had my kids learn to row at five years old. They had their own singles, right? The first time they went to this little river sculling camp, uh, the Hopkins run, they went and my kid was so excited. My kids wouldn't eat pineapple. But the prize for who could flip your boat and get back in the fastest was a piece of frozen pineapple on a string. My kid was so excited. He now eats pineapple because at six years old, he flipped his boat faster than somebody else and got a pineapple. And little secret, everybody got a pineapple. But I mean, like, it meant so much to him. It was a freaking frozen pineapple on a string. And um, so I just think that we are fundamentally flawed with the manner in which we, we point the arrow. If every athlete's an arrow, we're always pointing it towards winning or an erg score or a number or ACT or SAT. Our kids think their value is a number. It's not a healthy approach at many levels. So, Michael, again, not an exact answer. That is, if they started one to two years earlier, and, and I will say this from my club's point of view, we started in seventh grade. We win most of the races we, we, we enter because all of our kids start in seventh grade. They've got three years of rowing before my team races your team. And they all, by the way, can row a single. So we're probably going to do pretty well. But does that make us better in the long run as a country? I'm not sure it's, that's as simple an answer because I think we're fundamentally flawed on a lot of levels. Will? I just, I, I'll just add to you from Dr. Seiler's talk about, you know, the, the pyramid of endurance hierarchies, but the foundation was on physical and mental health. We can do the same thing with all of this endurance training stuff that it's got to be on this foundation of athleticism. And so uh, talking about the athletic motor skill competencies uh, that I'm going to talk about in the strength training, DJ brought a lot of emphasis to that through writing about, you know, all the ways that we can teach watership uh, through through non rowing activities as youths, I think that that recreational component is is really huge. Chris, a couple yep. more questions coming in here. Uh, will ADM become part of U.S. rowing coaching requirements? <laughs> this is such a trap question. We all know that when U.S. rowing tries to require anything, it starts a firestorm. So I will start off by saying that tongue in cheek. Um, you know, look, uh, right now our sport has a lot of growing pains to go through before we can require anything. Like we all need coaches so bad that we actually are dumbing down our expectations just to have a body in a boat. And we have to be better than that. But we also have to be realistic and, and, and have enough people to even fulfill what we need. So, you know, requiring safe sport, think about this, requiring safe sport had people writing us saying, how dare you? They didn't even understand that safe sport was a federal thing that was forced upon us by USOPC, but even requiring safe sport, which we can all agree is important, given the stories that come out of soccer and gymnastics and all these other places, and even our own sport, right? I mean, it's not too long ago that we've, we've had headlines in our sport. Requiring safety, you know, look at what happened at, at, you know, recently with tragedies. Like, so is it going to be a requirement anonymous attendee? I'd like to think that over time, we will reach a point where the product is so good that people are running towards us, not being forced towards us and that they want this. I hope that there's a point in time where clubs require this because it's at that level that that's where the requirement's going to have to happen. You're going to have to say, I'll hire you as a coach or I'll keep you on as a coach, but it is my intention that you go and you get this, this, uh, this training, this ADM training. My wife every year has to do five hours of uh, continuing education to maintain her teacher status in New York. If clubs were to say, for you to keep te uh, coaching here, I want you to get a certain number of hours, you know, an ADM could be one of those things. So I'm sorry I'd made light of it in the beginning because it's been a rough week, but, you know, the requirement has to start at the club level, not at U.S. rolling down for, for multiple reasons. 
Will, I know we got to go soon. Can I tackle that last question uh, yeah, shoot. In, in the QA? All right. So, because this, this question got me really excited. So, the question, um, they're fascinated by the idea of competition externalization and ownership of the athlete over their training. Um, how do we put the training back in the, an agency back in the hand? I think this is a great question. I think this is something yeah. growing could gain a lot from and kind of managing the pressures on the athletes. I think the big thing, there's a ton of work done by really intelligent people in educational psychology about identity formation and intrinsic motivation that I think you should go seek out and read on your own time, but it's good stuff. But I think the big thing this model hopes to accomplish, one, is uh, kind of making the, the recreational path or, or, or expanding the, the area or the tone of the youth rowing beyond winning a race. Yeah, um, so 100%. The most ba- the most basic step, right, if you want somebody to own the process is to have them set their goals, but you need to make sure that the environment and the structure you're building or the training then matches that. So is the club or is the team ready for a goal that doesn't involve winning a race? But once you validate those goals, then that sort of true ownership is going to begin to emerge. They're going to start to self-identify as a rower who, who loves the sport. And often you're going to find once they self-identify as a rower, they're not going to need to be externally Compl- compl- complied or compelled to, to do the training because it's theirs. Once you build the space for the them to do the work that matches their goals, you're going to have no problem having athletes that own their goals and having those ones that want to go fast, go as fast as they're able to do. So, yeah. The other thing, um, DJ, is you, you said, you know, when they identify as being a rower, when they identify as being an athlete, you know, so much mm-hmm. changes, right? They start worrying about their sleep. They start worrying about the nutrition. They start worrying about all the things that it takes just to be an athlete. And so I try to talk to my sons in, in the format of, I want that. I just want you to be an athlete. I don't care if you win, lose, do this sport, do that. Sport. You can do any sport you want. You know, just like start thinking like an athlete. Go to bed, get your nine to 10 hours of sleep at your age. You know, make sure you're eating this, you know, make sure you're eating that. You know, I, I wish I had the trick about the pineapple earlier because maybe they'd eat broccoli and stuff. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, so yeah, identifying as an athlete, that's one of the places that we have to change also the paradigm. We're trying to create athletes who happen to row. Right. You know, like not rowers mm-hmm. who are going to be overuse injuries at 18, blowing out discs. So um, I yeah. want to thank everybody for coming. It's such an important topic. And and I will I just want to say this to everybody who's listening. DJ and Will have been awesome at moving this mountain along. And, you know, when you look back and this move, you know, shifts the paradigm. Uh, I just want to thank you guys for being, you know, the, you know, the, the energy that did this. So. I just didn't want to lose the moment to be able to say that to you guys. Cheers. Thanks to you for organizing it. Thanks to everybody else on the task force for helping with the brainstorming. So team, team lift for sure. Um, And I hope everybody's excited to hear more about the ADM in the rest of our conferences this week. So we've got about 12 minutes before uh, we're on with Manny Valentin talking about building a middle school program. Thanks everybody for attending.